Well, hello everybody, and uh, welcome to our next part of our SX939 video series. <clears throat> and um, before we flip over and start working on the controls and on the tone section and everything of this receiver, I have to finish doing these couple capacitors on the FM muting board, uh, which will be very, very simple. But a question I get asked an awful lot is how to deal with these little wire wrap posts. Um, they seem to be a source of uh, frustration for a lot of people. And uh, I get asked over and over again how, how to take those wires off. Well, they're basically the best way to do it is with a little device, a little tool called a wire unwrap tool. Now there's wire wrap and unwrap. So that's what you're looking at right here. Here's a couple examples of factory made ones. There's also a homemade one that maybe we'll try to do here. I'll show you. But the first type, these two types here are only for removing wire wrap. And if you notice, they actually have different diameters on them. Uh, for the different wire wrap posts. There's tiny little ones and it goes anywhere from uh, maybe in the 20, 22 gauge up to clear up into the 30 gauge range um, or smaller. And so the first thing is you want to make sure you purchase the, and just you go online and do a, you can do a search for wire unwrap tool and you'll see all kinds of them come up. Uh, there's a company called Jon Jonard or Jonard, 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 <laughs> J-O-N-A-R-D. They're one of the most popular ones out there, but there are many, you know, there's ones made over in China and all kinds of places that you can get these. Now this is an all-in-one wire wrap tool, and you can see it goes between 22 and 24 gauge wire it has an unwrap tool on this end, and it actually has a wrapping tool on this end. Um, and I'm not going to go into how to do wire wrap with these today, because that's really not the not the point here. And it has a little stripper that you can strip the wire to that you're going to wrap. <coughs> but we're going to talk today about how to remove the wire. So using these little tools, and just so you know, you can make one, and. Uh, the way that you'll do it, well here let me get one out, I'll show you. Okay, here we go. So what you're gonna do is you're just gonna get yourself a piece of brass tubing and you can buy this at the hardware store, believe it or not. Make sure it's brass, the aluminum's not hard enough. Um, and you're just gonna file kind of a little ramp onto it, like the, like a little hook. I don't know if you can see that clearly or not, but you're just going to have this little hook that you're going to file in there. And uh, let me see. You can use a file like this. It just has to have a sharp edge on one edge of the file. So like a little triangular file, tiny one, or one of these little flat files. Um, it doesn't have to have the radius, it can be just an angled one. I just pulled this one out of my drawer. But you're going to file that little profile into there like that. And then all you do is you take your little brass rod and you place it over. Let me see if I can zoom you in without getting too far out of focus. Right like that and you just turn it and you can see it just pulls it right off just like that and it unwinds it. Now to put it back on you would have to strip it and you know resolder it or you can put it back on like this and if you're tricky enough you can take a little pair of needle nose and pliers and you can push it down and just rotate it clockwise and it'll wind right back up on there just like this. You have to be careful. You don't want to break anything. 
it's touchy and you have to be patient but it works and you can see when you're done it puts it all back on like normal now this is not acceptable to leave this way um, the wire wrap tools that put this on wrap it around these little metal posts these are square if you look very closely you notice they're square and they will actually put that on there very very tightly and so much so that it'll actually those little square corners will cut into the wire to make really good contact and this is this is just as good as soldering when you first put it on now when you return the wire like this it's never a good idea to just leave that you do want to resolder that so I will put a, a dab of solder on there um, the other thing is when you bend these wires it anneals the the wire and it will cause the wire to become brittle and it'll crack so sometimes when you do this you can kind of feel it um, the wire will get too brittle and you'll have to strip it back a little bit and, and wrap around a couple times with your pliers and then solder it on but that's how I handle it now there's a couple of other math uh, you know if you, you can use these tools here so we have this one and we're going to remove this ground wire so we can get in here so here is the this is just a normal one and you can see it has that same little hook on it just like the one we made homemade and you can put it down on here if the camera is not too bad in the way <laughs> I can't even see what I'm doing here and once you get down over it it will unwind it of course you have to have a little bit of this to, to get on it you have to have a little bit of the post protruding this one does not so you may have to uh, start it kind of like that to get it going and then you just you can see this just kind of unwinds it and believe it or not there you go and then you just turn it clockwise to screw it back out and that one's off the, th the third type is this one and you can see it has a little sleeve on it and that little sleeve is spiraled inside let me see if I can there you go and I'll show you how it works if we go on that you just push it down on you push down rotate it and it takes it right out and these ones are nice because look at how the first tool took took the wire off look at how the second tool took the wire off it kept it intact so we can actually slide it back on and it's very easy with the needle nose to wind it back on so this is the best of them of course these tools can get very expensive I mean you can spend fifty or sixty dollars US on one of these if you're not careful you can find them online there are some Chinese ones the cheapest I have ever seen one as far as in American dollars is the ten to twelve dollar range um, so even that's a lot of money and as you saw my homemade one didn't do a bad job now the only thing is you know you're limited to the diameter of tubing that's available to you and these do wear out because they're they're brass and they're not hardened steel but it's very easy in one minute to touch that up with your file and you can get a big long piece of this stuff and it'll last you a very long time before I ha had these tools that's how I did it now again you can put a, an eBay search out and every now and then uh, some some companies um, or some people that retire and so surplus places they'll actually uh, sell them used and sometimes you can get a really good deal on them and get them very very inexpensively uh, so that's it that's how I deal with those um, hopefully that'll help you out the next time that you have to deal with one and uh, that's really all there is but just remember when you put them back on solder them don't 
trust winding the wire back on because you may not get it tight enough to get a good connection on there. Once you break that connection, um, it's not going to be the same afterwards. So that's it. I'm going to get this recap now, and then when I come back, we're going to look at the uh, underside and start looking at the, uh, the controls and the tone control section and everything. All right, once you pull the knobs off of the front, um, you'll have two little brass things here, one up here and one down here. And you can see that the nut can go on there. There's a little nut that goes over those for the, to hold the face plate on. And then two little screws in the upper cor top corners, one on this side and one on this side. And that is the only four pieces of hardware holding the face plate on. The face plate will just kind of fall right off after you do that. There's also a little plastic bushing that houses the tuning knob that's just kind of press fit over there and it just pulls right off. And off comes the face plate. So now we can actually see all the boards. Now I'm going to start with this board. This one, the knobs are really seized up pretty bad. Um, they're really stiff and uh, they need really cleaned up pretty well. And to get this out, we're going to have to take the nuts off the front. And I just use a regular nut driver to take those off. And then these little screws here and here, here and here, and here and here. So there's six screws and the nuts. And then this whole module will just kind of slide out and we'll be able to work on it. And you're going to see that it's all encased in metal. And that metal is actually a, a noise shield. So that's what makes these amplifiers very quiet. Again, um, in this generation, they did little the little extra things like that to make these just that much better. So they're really well built little receivers. So let me get uh, let me get those screws off of there and get that hardware off the front, and I'll show you how this comes out. So with all the hardware out, all we're going to do is this thing just almost falls out, and when we flip it around. You can see what I'm talking about, this little metal box. And there's four screws, two and two, that takes this off and allows us to get into the tone control amplifier or tone control section. So let me get this off and we'll look inside. So we get the cover off and you can see the inside of the tone controls. So you have your two bass and your two treble controls. And these don't believe it or not, these are potentiometers. They don't look like it, but they actually are. And you can see the little um, the little notches here for the steps. So they kind of mimic a stepped attenuator, but really, even though they have little steps, they're they're notched, it's actually a a potentiometer. So if you look over here, you can see the material underneath here, the wipers inside here and here. These are stereo pots for right and left channel. And uh, cleaning them is a little bit tricky, but the reason these get so seized up in here is because the grease that's inside here will dry up really, really bad. And then it just becomes like wax and it just makes everything real sluggish. So to really get in there and clean, I mean, you could clean it as it is now, but you can take the screws here and up here out from the other side and you can sl actually slide this little U bracket right off and completely have full access all the way around to these to clean them properly. And you can see there's a whole bunch of potential uh, uh, capacitors in here that will need uh, taken care of while we're in here. Now on the higher end models of these they do instead of a pot they actually put stepped attenuators in there. So for instance, um, the SA9100, which I did a video on that, it has a very similar looking control to this, but they're actual switches and they have a whole bunch of little terminals around them and each step is a different little capacitor and it's actually a stepped uh, switch that pulls in different capacitors to change the bass and treble tone controls. Um, so instead of having a potentiometer 
moving, you're actually solidly selecting individual audio grade capacitors. So a lot messier, but also a lot more elegant than, than this. But these work really well also. This is a really good tone section. So we're going to go through and replace all these electrolytics in here. We're going to check all these transistors. Um, I can already see that a lot of them are starting to get that uh, funny looking tarnish on them. So I may just go ahead and replace them, even though they don't usually fail in here. But the only thing that concerns me is that tarnish. And I, and I know the, uh, the owner had requested that any ones that had that tarnish he wanted replaced um, just, just as a uh, future proofing thing even though they may be working right now just fine. And who knows, they may work another 20 or 30 years like that, but they may not. So we'll do that. Um, everything else looks good in here, so it doesn't look like anybody has ever serviced it, which is a good thing. That's always a good thing. And uh, so let me get everything cleaned up and replaced, and we'll be back. All right, we got all the components changed. We have all the new uh, capacitors and transistors. Um, all of the ones that were in the audio path, I replaced with these Kemet uh, film capacitors. And the uh, rest of them are all done. And uh, we swapped out all the transistors. And the transistors all were pretty good. And when I checked them, <laughs> there was no actual tarnish on those ones. They were, they were still in pretty good shape. They do have a little uh, like paint coating on the leads to help them not to tarnish. And down where the paint was not at, there was not any tarnish, so they were still good. But again, um, you know, inside here, I like, after working on so many of these receivers, I kind of like to replace <clears throat> these ones in here anyways, just because they get noisy. Um, the first symptom you'll see on these is when you turn the volume all the way down and if you're wearing headphones especially and uh, I actually have a pair of headphones that has the uh, noise canceling um, sometimes I'll use them to listen to YouTube videos and things when the television's running in the living room and so forth and they work really well but they also enhance any kind of background hiss and these transistors as they start to get noisy the first thing they do is they you start to get that hiss in the background and it gets louder and louder then eventually as the transistors fail with age um, they'll start to crackle and cut in and out and get all kinds of weird problems but at first they just get noisy with hiss so when you replace them all with new ones uh, usually that ensures that that you know that that's not going to have have that problem for a very long time. So, anyways, um, this thing's all ready to go together. Got these cleaned up, and now they just like butter. They just turn, no problem at all, which is uh, a good thing. <laughs> they were just so stiff; um, they didn't even click, and now they're clicking. Everything's working good. So, time to put it together and give it a test. Well, it's a working, and the tone controls work good, and uh, we have success. So I'm going to finish putting this part together, and I'm going to start moving on up and take care of the tone controls. And then last but not least, we're going to tackle the phono section. And uh, after that, I think we're ready for start putting it together and give it the real test. So this thing's turning out really, really nice. So I cleaned the balance and volume pot, and I just wanted to stop and show you all why I like the, this vintage equipment. This is an actual metal plate that's tying all the switches and pots together. Um, as you saw, the same thing on the tone control section. And look at this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight screws and two nuts holding just that metal plate on. Um, talk about just solidly built. I mean, none of these are ever going to move because this is fastened to the frame of the receiver. So, you know, as far as, you know, the 
pots and switches wiggling around and wiggling the solder joints loose on the board. Never going to happen. These things were built like a tank, and they were built to last forever, pretty much. And uh, that's why I really like them. So there it is. <laughs> Take a good look, because I don't think uh, I don't think there's anything else out there today that that they're building to this quality level. I don't know. Okay, it's now uh, time to do the tuner. I have the the caps changed on that uh, phono stage as I showed and it's a new day here and we're set up to do our FM alignment first and uh, we're going to use something new this time we're going to use one of these little PC based oscilloscopes and I think it's going to be really cool for these videos because you get the nice big computer screen that we can use to actually look at the waveforms and uh, just a little tiny unit right there you can see so we're trying this out this is actually a four channel 200 megahertz one giga sample scope so if it works out um, we'll be seeing a lot more of it now in order to do the FM alignment on this of course it just seems like no two receivers are the same the procedure they give you they're all a little bit different they're just doing the same thing just coming at it from different angles here so for this particular alignment, what we're going to need is we're going to need our FM signal generator. And we're just going to use our 8657 up here. They want uh, 75 kilohertz deviation. They want a 400 hertz tone for modulation. And they want us to start out at 98 megahertz. And they're looking at about 500 microvolts um, going into the uh, input of the tuner. So not super critical, but that's where they want you to be. And they also, in parallel, want us to connect the distortion meter. And you can see up there I have it connected. And it's just connected in parallel with one of the channels. And our two channels over there are connected to the recording jacks, the recording output for the tape jacks on the receiver. So what you're looking at right now is your 400 hertz uh, tone. And the first thing they have you do is you're going to go down to the actual meter. You're going to turn off the RF altogether. And they want you to go to the bottom core of the discriminator coil, which is this one right here. And there's two cores. There's an upper one here. And then if you push all the way through it, there's a lower one down here at the bottom and all you're going to do is adjust that bottom core to get that centered and it was way off um, I could tell when I first started this that it was off uh, before you know when I first turned this on for the first time because when you tune to the center of the channel the needle was always to the right of center so we got that pretty much centered now then we're going to go to the top core up here. We're going to turn our carrier on and tune it to 98 megahertz. And what I'm going to show you is, first of all, as you tune through the 98 megahertz, you can see it cutting in and out. And we want to center it right on the channel, just like that. And then we're going to adjust that core for a minimum of distortion. So we're going to go up to our distortion meter. And I'll zoom you in. And I'm just going to turn that upper core, wrong way, till I get all the way down as far as it'll go. And you can see we got a little bit out of it. And now see it peaked. It, it, you got a trough, now it starts climbing back up. So we're going to just go through that little null point. And right there, we have it set to minimum. Simple as that. All right, let me get set up for the next test, and I'll show you what we're doing next. All right, for our next setting, we're going to move to 90 megahertz and we're going to go to a real low signal. 
um, they want somewhere around 1.5 to 1.8 microvolts. That's a little bit too noisy. You can hear it, but it's easier with a little bit more drive than that. So I'm a little bit higher than that. And we want to tune right on to 90 megahertz. Even if we don't get a, the clearest signal at 90, we want to tune it right on to 90. And if you listen, you can just barely hear it. But that's okay. Now we're going to go to our oscillator coil, which is right here. And we're going to set our oscillator at the 90 megahertz point. We're going to set it for accuracy. So let me find the slug in here. It's hard to look around the camera. There we go. And let's, let's watch our scope as I adjust this. And you can hear it. And the idea is you want those little noise spikes to be pretty symmetrical on the top and the bottom, which is kind of where we are right now. And if that's correct, if we go down to our centering meter, the needle should be pretty much centered, and it is. So we're good there. And you can see if we drive, put our drive up just a little bit, comes right in. So, all right, so now we do that. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to move up to 106 megahertz. So we're going to go up here and we're going to go frequency 106 megahertz. And we're going to tune to 106 megahertz. Again, we're going to go right on the money, right on 106. And you can see we're already a little bit there, but as you can see how the distortion is at the top, but not at the bottom, that's telling us that it's off peak just a little bit. So we're going to go and we're going to jump on to, let's see, which one? Got to make sure I got the right one here. We're going to go to this one right here, the FM oscillator. So I'm going to have to change tools here. Let me get a different tweaker and I'll be right back. Okay, I have the tweaker here. And uh, you're going to find that this one is extremely touchy. This is a little capacitor, a little trimmer cap. And it, they're super duper touchy. So we're going to just barely move it and you're going to see it's going to make a big change. So here we go. Gone. <laughs> and I just barely touched it. Okay, let's get our peaks right there. And our centering meter should be right there. Right there. And that's good. Okay, so that's set up. Now for our next alignment. We want to go back down to 90 megahertz, and we're going to adjust our RF coils now. So let me get set up for 90 megahertz, and we'll be right back. Okay, so we're in our first one here, and I found that the easiest way to get this is to use the signal strength meter and look at your scope. You know, this kind of gives you a little indication. So watch as I adjust it, and I'll zoom you in a little better, and we can see that uh, brought it up right there. Then we go to the next coil. So we're just doing these three RF coils right now, and you can see that one looks pretty well peaked right there. And then we go to our last one. And we got it right about there. And that's about as good as we'll get that. All right, on to the next one. 
I now have the signal generator set to 106 megahertz and I have it tuned on the receiver to 106 megahertz and now we're going to just set up our RF capacitor trimmers right here so you have RF 1, 2 and 3 and we're going to basically do the same thing we're going to adjust for maximum peak see I don't know how much of this I can get all in the shot hopefully you can see some of this happening and let's see and that one's not doing too much there so we're not going to touch that too far again these are probably dead on as they are and that's why I'm not going to try to adjust them too much. Alright, that one was, yep, right on. So far, so good. That one was just a hair. Okay, so those were actually almost perfect. Those were very, very close. As I expected them, I mean, this whole receiver wasn't too far off. The thing that seems to drift on these older receivers like this, um, this type of design, is the discriminator. It'll kind of go off a little bit with time. But everything else usually is pretty close. I mean, sometimes the little trimmer caps or something will go out a teeny bit, or a capacitor may change, something may change, but usually not too much. And then that's really it for the FM. If, if you get that done and it peaks out for you, the FM is all done and we can go and start working on the multiplex, which multiplex on this one, at least the FM stereo, just from how it was reacting as I was using it earlier, it was, it was a little bit off. And that could have been because of the discriminator here, but it also could be that the uh, multiplex needs adjusted. So let me get all set up for that and we'll be back. All right, I totally messed up the camera on this last one, so we're doing we're doing take two. So we're set up for our multiplex alignment, and I'll try to explain this mess to you guys as best I can. Um, up here, I have my SG165 uh, stereo analyzer. All I'm using that for is a multiplex signal generator. So it's going to generate the pilot tone, and it's going to generate your right and left um, stereo signals. So it's a multiplex signal. If you're don't, not familiar with what I'm talking about, uh, you can go back and look at some of my videos dealing with uh, what, how FM stereo multiplex works. Um, so that signal is coming out, and you can see it's got a splitter right here. We've got a splitter set up. And one of the wires is going over to the modulation input of the 8657. So we're FM modulating the signal with that multiplex signal, if that makes sense to you at all. And then the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to is we're going to go ahead and we're going to set our scope up, and that the other part of that wire that split off. The scope is set up for XY mode. Some of you may understand this, some of you may not. And we're going into the X with our pilot signal from the multiplex. And then the Y is going down to this test point down here, which is test point 18. At this point in time, that'll set us up that we can actually put a signal into here. And we should be able to um, listen to our right and left stereo signals and we're going to actually look for a signal up here uh, called a Lissajou pattern. So once I get this all set up, I'll come back and turn it on and hopefully you'll see what I'm talking about. So here we have our Lissajou pattern and I just have one of the channels on and you could turn left or right, it doesn't matter. And if you look down on here, what you're actually seeing is the two channels. And let me see what's going on here because I got some other weird stuff going on. Okay, my wife was calling me and all kinds of other things going on. So here's our Lissajou pattern. 
and all we're going to do is we're going to adjust the uh, the one pot here I'll show you which one right by the discriminator down here this pot we're going to adjust that to get a stable signal which we've already got okay but I'll, sh I'll show you what it looks like when you adjust it and you can see it kind of does that and when it's not right see how it jitters and the idea is you want it to come in like that straight all right and sometimes you can get a better pattern than this um, but I didn't hook up perfectly to the pilot uh, that will get <laughs> I'll have to do a different video on that but I can see what I need to see now the other thing we're looking for down here is we're looking at our actual um, down here and we got something weird going on with the receiver hold on okay I had to readjust one of my probes it was loose there so the next thing we're gonna do is as you can see I have one channel turned on now if I turn that channel off turn the other one on and you can see how it alternates now what we're looking at and what we're interested in for this next adjustment is down here see all those little squares so our separation is not set properly yet so that's going to be the other pot that's right next to it which is right here you can see it so I'm going to adjust that pot and you're going to see what kind of effect that has on this see that and the idea is to just kind of minimize that till they're just little noise peaks like that no square waves or anything like that all right and you're going to do the first adjustment then you're going to switch channels this is how I do it and then you check and make sure the other channel is equally as suppressed and if that's all good then you're all adjusted now while you're doing this you also want to kind of make sure that your list as you pattern stays stable and doesn't jitter you might have to go back and touch that other pot but that's it now we have stereo separation so the next thing I'm going to do now is I'm going to take all the test equipment off because now we're done with FM and with multiplex and we're going to hook it back up to an antenna and just see what it sounds like all right let's do a tuning sweep and see what we get every little hair now huh and you can see now that we're centered the stereo lights coming on beautiful For the next gospel we see the Lord 101 like this one this one Thank you all. so you can see it woke that receiver right up it's perfect now so uh, that made a massive improvement just those little tweaks we did so um you know we do a recap and then we do our alignment and you can see what a huge difference it makes so that's how I do it again um, every receiver has a little bit different alignment if you go back to the Sansui video I think that was the receiver I did before this one on video anyways um, you'll see that that one actually was uh, a totally different procedure um, the test equipment that they recommend is totally different so <laughs> you kind of have to I say this in every video that I do in alignment you have to adapt your your procedure to the test equipment you have on hand you can't possibly have every type of test equipment um, but there you go now we're gonna go through and do the AM which I usually do that one off camera because quite frankly doing the AM on this great big receiver as fancy and complicated as that may be is really nothing compared to uh, it's really the same thing as doing a, a basic little AM radio you just have your 
you know, your IF and your oscillator, you know, local oscillator. Very simple, couple little tweaks and it's all set. So I'll do that off camera. And uh, that's it. This is, this is done. So next time we come back, you'll see the whole thing put all together and we'll give it one last try and make sure everything works. All right, so we've got the receiver all put back together and we've got the, those little grain of wheat bulbs replaced with all LEDs. We've got those all tied up good. And uh, now we're ready to just finish cleaning off the terminals. I did give the amp a quick test and it's putting out pretty much a clean 83 watts per channel. Uh, <clears throat> everything's looking pretty good so far. So um, let me get this, get the top put on. Uh, take one final look at the insides, and uh, this will be ready to go back to the owner. All right, we got this receiver set up, and as you can see, we have uh, all the controls set. I have the loudness switch off. I have the uh, our little digital player on. We got it hooked up to our Klipsch speakers. And we have our Yeti mic, you can see kind of lined up with the speakers, so uh, let's kick this thing on and see what it sounds like. <laughs> 